The mystery over Namo TV continues. The channel that appeared on pretty much all platforms about a week ago has raised several questions. Uh, now, the channel airs speeches uh, by Narendra Modi, apart from other promotional me material featuring BJP leaders. After complaints from political parties, the Election Commission has sent a notice to the Information and Broadcast Ministry uh, that has asked uh, for time until the 5th of April to reply. Meanwhile, uh, online uh, website, The Print, reported, uh, uh, quoting government sources, that there was no application for a license for the channel at all. The situation got even more curious when Tata Sky responded to a query on Twitter saying the channel is a Hindi news service. A few hours later, the CEO of Tata Sky denies this uh, while speaking to NDTV and says it's a special services channel. So two questions, basically. Is this channel indeed a violation of the model code of conduct? That's a question that the Election Commission is exploring. And how does a channel broadcast without applying for a license? Uh, to speak on this, I'm joined now by former Information and Broadcast Secretary and former CEO of Prasar Bharti, Jawahar Sarkar. Uh, and I'm also speaking with Apar Gupta, a Supreme Court uh, um, advocate. Welcome to both of you and thank you for speaking to us today. Uh, Mr. Sarkar, let's just start with what we know um, and not apart from what has been reported. We know that there is a complaint to the Election Commission and the INB Ministry uh, has to respond officially till now. And we know for a fact that Tata Sky responded to a user saying this is a Hindi news service, something which was denied later. Can we start by understanding how the process works and how this channel would have started airing? You see, every channel has to apply for a broadcast license for the simple reason that you are using wireless waves. Now, wireless waves in this country and in the rest of the world are governed by certain laws. There is an international telecom union that has apportioned the use of airwaves and their particular uh, slots. In India, we have something called, I mean, something uh, called the WPC, Wireless Planning and Coordination, WPC Committee, that allots airways. Now, am I to understand that Namo Channel is not using any airwave altogether? The use of any airwave or sound, uh, airwave or radioactive wave is covered by the Wireless Act. It is covered by tri regulations. It is covered by this WPC. Now, they have done resorted to a, to, uh, to a stratagem, if I may use the term, by linking directly with the, with the DTH operators and the cable operators. Where the cable operators are concerned, they can say that they have not touching airwaves. But where DTH operators are concerned, they are actually going through airwaves. Number one. So this, and the, the, the more interesting question is that of justice. Supposing there is a chink in the law there, uh, it is necessary for all of us to check that chink. What if a hundred per, per persons come forward now and set up channels that are directly linked with, <coughs> linked with cable or DTH and say, we don't need wireless licenses. We don't need broadcast licenses. We don't need uplink and downlink licenses. The whole licensing system would fall flat. That has to be understood by India's most major party that it is it is playing havoc with its own government and its own set of regulations. Oh. I'll stop here. Let the uh, yeah. discussion no, proceed. Yeah. No, let, me, let me just ask a follow-up question. So you said that it, it seems that this channel is, is beaming because they seem to have bypassed a certain procedure where you apply for a license and gone straight to cable operators in DTH. Um, why do you think this has happened? Because uh, frankly, right now it's a mystery. We really don't know till there is an official reply from the INB. What are you basing this, uh, this assessment on? See, the, I am basing it on the standard rules that have governed standard human beings and standard companies in India for the last 20, 30 years. I don't know what set of rules are being made for non-standard humans. This every person who has wanted to broadcast, you have been going for a TV channel, had to go to the rigor of being cross-checked, earnest money taken, security deposit taken, their verification made, 
they have to go through a whole plethora of processes, mainly to, in the interest of the Indian public. Now, here is one person who doesn't go through any processes altogether by saying that I don't need your license. Now, assuming, assuming for a second that what he says is correct, he's also saying no one needs a license henceforth. If you, if you connect directly with DTH operators and cable operators, why do you go through the Sarkari procedures of licenses? The licenses are there to govern, to govern, and they have been time tested. Hundreds of cases have gone to the High Court and Supreme Court. They have adjudicated. There is case law in this regard. Now, how can you completely upset a system by saying, well, these folks in this, this, this part doesn't apply to me? Okay. Here again, we're basing, this, uh, we're basing this on, on the report in the print quoting government sources. We've not independently verified that, but this is the information and it's skeletal. So we're talking about the information in the public domain right now. Uh, Rajas Doshi, who's uh, watching the show, writes in, what about Jaya TV? And I want to come to a par on this point. So in a lot of this discussion, and because, of course, it's turned political and uh, the Congress and the Aam Admi Party have gone to the EC and complained, a lot of people are asking that, hey, it's... It's not new to have channels which broadcast a certain party's uh, ideology officially. I'm not even talking about the un unofficial kind of push. Uh, but it's, it's, it's pretty fairly standard uh, in India and in various parts of India to have uh, channels which are basically mouthpieces for a particular party. Why is this different, Apar? I think it's uh, extremely different and deviates from the principle set uh, in India with respect to our observance of a legal standard for everyone being fairly same if the kind of operation they are doing is similar. This is also expressed by lawyers as what is called the rule of law rather than the rule of men. And I think Mr. Sirkar set it out quite clearly that the regulations which are there in India uh, contemplate that broadcast through the mode of television, which is now broken down, also through DTH as well as through local cable transmissions by itself of any channel, even when it uh, has political canvassing or ideologic, ideological leanings, has to go through a process. Let me just break down this process because then it also becomes useful to all the viewers and listeners of this program to get to know what are these kind of checks. These checks contemplate an application in which a company which makes the application to run a channel has to get clearance on the name so that it does not overlap with the existing channel. So there's a distinction made in the mind of the public. It has a minimum capitalization requirement to ensure that the funds which are there in this channel actually are enough to service and actually actually carry out operations in a reasonable manner. It requires the resume that uh, of the top officers of this channel to ensure that uh, there will be a journalistic and a rigorous bent to the uh, actual telecast itself. It requires a disclosure of the funding and shareholding to get to know what are the sources of the money coming in. And it, all of this then is gone and taken not only as a discretion for grant of the license, but also forms part of a confidential security clearance, which is then done by the Ministry of Home Affairs and given back to the Ministry of Information Broadcasting. No, but apart, apart, sorry, I'm just, I'm just going to stop you here. All of, all of these rules you're talking is assuming that this is a new service. Now we don't no, know that current, we don't know that for a fact because today the Tata Sky CEO was quoted saying this is a special services channel. I'm I'm not sure what that is. Please tell us if if you have uh, any more information there on that apart. No such, there, there is no such category. There is no such precedent. It seems to be a fairly creative expression which is not supported by the uplinking and downlinks, uh, downlinking license agreements because you need to broadcast the signals up and they need to come down also. So the uplinking and the downlinking licenses, or oh, it's outside the statutory ambit. I think, as Mr. Sirkar was pointing out, if we start just coining these phrases, such as special services, uh, such as uh, 
uh, something uh, or try to come out with such circumventions of set rules and processes. It is not in the spirit of the broadcasting regulatory framework in India. And a special allowance, in fact, is being made for somebody without a clear legal reason or justification. I think it's a clear affront to how the media regulation and broadcasting space, which has a very important principle called the level playing field, is being interfered with. Okay, um, let me take that to Jawahar Sarkar because Apar makes the point about level playing field. It is anyway at the discretion of the government. Now, we don't know what the INB ministry will say, but they will be required to give an explanation. Uh, are we safely going with the assumption that no uh, application was even made for this channel? Perhaps it was, and, and we don't know. This was, this was done on the presumption that the ministry would remain docile, quiet, and not raise questions when a so-called gray area is discovered. Again, this discovery it could also be with the help of experts, both within and without. What I'm trying to say, what Upper has said, that the entire broadcasting regulation framework will fall flat on its nose. Billions and billions of dollars are involved in this business, and any transgression of moral codes, any transgression of economic and broadcast codes means jeopardy to the whole system that has been built up by the lawmakers, by the administrators, and by the courts over a 30-year period. Now, having said that, I had raised this issue of what if somebody comes up tomorrow, and why not? saying that I want to do exactly the same thing. Why on earth should I go through uplinking and downlinking? Why on earth should I tell you how solvent I am? Why on earth should I let you inquire whether I have any, you know, this for a government that is so tacky and, and, and believes that most of, much of India is anti-national. Why should I go to the harassing process of proving that I'm not an anti-national? Now, this is, you, can, you cannot kick a system while being in government, that is the second tragic point. But more important than broadcasting law framework are also allied frameworks of probity. Let me explain. Dry has a wealth of regulations. Dry has a system of going through collective, uh, collective uh, uh, coordination with the public and stakeholders and coming out with its regulation. Try came out with a regulation in February how channels are to be distributed. Well, where on earth would you put this special channel where the bookie is concerned? Where the bookie is concerned? There is a bookie of channels that has just been uh, uh, enlisted, just been announced by Try, and Try is desperately trying to execute it. I believe much of it has already been executed. Now, having arranged the pack of cards in the house in a particular manner, here comes somebody with a big breeze, a big, uh, let us say, test line, and he blows off every, all the cards. We can't function in this manner. I mean, the elections are not the beyond and end all of the Indian legal system, the Indian uh, system of propriety. What I'm, I'm raising a counter question to my former colleagues in INB and in other broadcasting agencies. How does this channel fit in with tries much publicized regulation. How does it fit in? Yeah. And someone explained, as upper put it, there is nothing called a special services. Each type of channel, even if you do not go through, let us say, for your argument's sake, you don't go through the wireless route. If we, if we disaggregate the wireless route, every channel has its own uh, slotting. We have news, we have entertainment, we have sports, we have uh, documentaries, we have many others. What is this what is the character of this channel is it fish or is it foul looks a bit fishy that's all uh, let me come to the other aspect of this and we've talked about broadcast regulations and possible violations in, in a fair amount of detail. But the fact is that this has become a big story also because this is a channel which seems to be dedicated uh, to beaming campaign messages uh, from the Prime Minister during election time. So two questions there. Uh, is it a violation of the model code of conduct? And what impact will it have uh, in 
anyway, um, broadcast space where there is so much of political content uh, being beamed in any case, at the end of the day, any viewer has the choice of whether they want to consume this channel or not. Uh, let me go with Apar first on that question. Uh, Tamanna, my biggest, biggest worry is that we are appending the rule of law and making uh, it goes with the uh, labeling of this channel itself. We are going with special rules which are being created for these elections. This is how institutions as well as the culture of governance is threatened. And I do sense the political controversy which has erupted around it. But it is, I feel my, uh, my responsibility as an expert who's seen this area, litigated these cases to say that special allowances are being made which are very dangerous and portend something very bad for a country like India which is needed, which needs a uniform set, standard setting in its policy. Uh, the second thing is that uh, I do think that having such a channel by itself may not be uh, or um, may may be or may not be a violation of the model code of conduct because i do see it as a broadcast violation at its very root with respect to the model code of conduct the election commission's subsequent action actually is much more important than the model code itself actually a lot of people know the model code is not legally enforceable by itself but leads to subsequent actions by the Election Commission as have been led in the past in terms of registration of FIRs under the Representation of People Act as well as under the Indian Penal Code. So what will inform us as to what is actually happening is not an uh, argument on the model code of conduct itself but the actual actions of the Election Commission which should also come within a reasonable time frame given that this is a channel which is broadcasting appeals in favor of a specific individual heading a specific political party and that kind of time period itself becomes a very critical determination. We will not benefit if there is a uh, restraint which is put after a week to 10 days. Finally, what you asked me about, how does that actually impact the la larger question of a lack of media diversity. And I think that's a much larger structural issue. We can have a separate show on that. And it is true, a lot of things need to be improved in the media space, but this is something which is just so beyond the pale of what is already happening. It's so apparent that it's so clear in a violation. It's, it's actually something which needs to be prevented at the first instance itself. Let, let me take that question uh, to uh, Mr. Sarkar. Um, and I just want to add over here that the EC has been getting a lot of flack um, over uh, many issues. But to be fair, they got the complaint. They have sent a notice and they're following the process. So. Um, let's not prejudge what they will do in advance. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, do you have any views on how this, two things, because of course in your experience as CEO of Prasar Bharti as well, how this will impact um, voters, because that seems to be the end game, uh, and a violation of the model code of conduct? I see, you see, the election commission is not the only repository of all intelligence and all morality regarding the elections. The commissioners come and go, and commissioners do impact on the policy. But the machinery of election runs almost autonomously. It is governed by its own principles. I have handled that machinery from returning officer, assistant returning officer, to election observer, and then the chief election, chief electoral officer of the state, being very much a part of the election commission. With all these seven elections, with which have been associated, there are certain very clear principles of justice that play. This falls flat on the grounds of justice and fair play, justice and equality of treatment. This is an attempt to project one individual because he is only trump card that a particular party has. If it had been a party channel, well, one could say 50-50. But uh, projecting one individual in a parliamentary system of democracy and then permitting it and then going, what do you mean by the election commission has sought for the views? The chief election commissioner himself was the information secretary for so long. Doesn't he know the act? We all belong to Sessions uh, boys. We are all Sessions boys and we know 
that to establish the rule of law in elections took a lot of courage. That is what is missing, courage. You use discretion in favor of good. Do not use discretion in favor of rules, saying that when Chikhtiliki, and that sort of thing shows uh, weak knees. An election commission should be seen as something strong, impartial, and a, a, a very good referee. It's falling in the eyes of the people. Doesn't Sunil Arora realize that? Big questions here. Uh, I want to thank uh, both Jawahar Sarkar and Apar Gupta for coming in with very uh, key points and valid questions on this uh, important subject. Again, more clarity is needed. Hopefully, there will be more clarity on this issue sooner than later. Thank you for watching.